Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Quacks Podcast. Now, I have quite the interview for you today. Magic mushrooms. <laughs> and one of the main ingredients in magic mushrooms, which is psilocybin, uh, they're really beginning to blow up in popularity. Uh, the John Hopkins Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research. How about that name? Uh, they are pouring millions of dollars into studying psilocybin for things like quitting smoking, easing anxiety in cancer patients and patients who are facing end of life, and treating alcoholism. Other studies are looking at anxiety, depression, and personality changes as well. So many different potential uses in fact, I was just recently reading about a potential investment in a company that is attempting to bring psilocybin to the market in some of these uh, places and countries that are legalizing magic mushrooms for medicinal use. So today, I have on Jonas Rosen, who works as a psychedelic facilitator down in Jamaica. Now, he basically gives people psilocybin in a controlled or safe setting to facilitate healing in all manner of things. I'll let him tell you all about that. It was a very interesting interview. I learned a lot about how psilocybin may be used and how it could be abused, potentially. So stay tuned until the end for some of my thoughts on whether psilocybin is something that you should consider taking or not. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. I have the privilege today of interviewing Jonas Rosen, who is a psychedelic facilitator at Myco Meditations in Jamaica. So, dude, thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm really excited to speak with you today because it seems like psychedelics and, you know, med medicinal mushrooms, all these substances are, are getting more and more you know, time in the media as potentially being therapeutic for anxiety, depression, all kinds of different things. And I listened to a podcast recently by Jordan Peterson where he interviews this guy who is a researcher on mushrooms, and he, he really kind of dives deep into the research aspect of it, but I really wanted to talk to somebody who kind of had boots on the ground, like experience with using these in a somewhat clinical uh, setting. So thanks so much for coming on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a it's an absolute pleasure. And uh, yeah, I mean, just as you were saying that, it, it, is, it is funny, you know, it's something that I think about often how... One mushrooms. I mean, they're they're one, uh, some of the oldest organisms on planet Earth. You know, they've been around for billions of years and and used by our ancestors for many thousands of years in uh, both healing and sacramental contexts. And yeah, it's just it's just interesting that now there's kind of this rediscovery, right? This renaissance of interest in in psychedelic medicines and psychedelic assisted therapy uh, in in you know the 21st century. So yeah, it's pleasure pleasure to be on. So I'm not too familiar with what you actually do, what your uh, job is like, what the clinic is like. I think it's it's down in Jamaica, correct? So so what's going on down there? That's right. Well, so in Jamaica, psychedelic mushroom psilocybin is completely legal. So everything that's happening there is is legal. It's it's above above the board. Uh, we've got a highly trained staff with a uh, licensed therapist and a licensed nurse on every single retreat. So it's, it's a retreat center. It's not a clinic. So what we offer is a uh, week long retreats. Um, guests come from all over the world, uh, mostly from the United States, come down to Jamaica and participate in week long retreats. And yeah, my, my title is, is psychedelic facilitator. And my role is really to facilitate uh, the optimal outcomes to be to be there with the guests through the entire retreat experience, you know, and to just kind of walk side by side with uh, people, you know, go, getting into the psychedelic experience from uh, beforehand, sort of this preparation phase, this preparatory phase to during the experience itself, as well as the really important uh, after afterwards, this integration phase. Um, so yeah, I have a, you know, slightly different roles for each of those three phases before, during, and after, but it's all sort of under the umbrella of, of psychedelic facilitator. So when these people come down to this facility, what is their goal? Well, I mean, there's such a diverse, uh, mix of people that are coming through. Everyone has different goals. I would say the majority of people are, are coming with, with healing in mind, you know, uh, probably over fifty percent of the of the guests who are coming down 
are dealing with uh, moderate to severe cases of depression, anxiety, trauma, addiction, OCD, a wide range of mental mental health uh, conditions. And, you know, a lot of people, it's not, it's not uncommon to hear people say that uh, I've been in therapy for 10 years now. You know, I've tried every SSRI antidepressant on the market. I've tried all the benzos, you know, all the pharmaceutical drugs and nothing has worked. And I'm, I'm looking for that breakthrough, getting really frustrated and almost, you know, like uh, just really needing healing. And uh, so a significant, a significant portion of the, the guests are coming through uh, looking for healing. But of course, I mean, we're all such complex beings. There's, there's usually not one single reason why people are coming. A lot of people are coming for, uh, you know, spiritual uh, exploration. Some are, some are coming because they're really just curious. They've, they've been reading a lot of intriguing things and they want to try it for themselves. Other people are coming for, you know, creative breakthroughs. We have uh, artists and and all different types of creatives coming through, as well as scientists looking through for uh, sort of breakthroughs in in their work in their research. So it's a very it's a very diverse and, and really interesting mix of people coming through the retreat center there. Wow. So what is if you could maybe just walk us through the process? Because you mentioned there that there was like a, an induction phase, and then uh, I, I can't remember the word you use, but afterwards when you're you're integrating it, what would be like if somebody were going to go do this, what, what are the different phases they do? Well, I mean, for, for every psychedelic experience, right, there's a before, during, and after. And uh, the, all, all, all three of them are, are really important. Beforehand, there is sort of like a, a, a preparation. Um, and there's different ways of doing this. And um, some, people, some people are approaching this in a much more intentional way way than than others i mean in some cases people kind of just stumble their way into the psychedelic experience and there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever it's certainly happened in a number of occasions in my life but uh uh, I think to really maximize the outcomes, to really maximize the benefits that we're receiving from from this medicine, uh, some degree of preparation is important, and that 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 looks like a lot of different things. I mean, I think that's one: being informed, having some knowledge about what this experience is like, uh, coming at it with this degree of in, intentionality and, and self awareness. You know, really considering why we one uh, an individual feels drawn to this experience, what we hope to gain out of it. Uh, feeding our minds with with good inputs, you know, like absorbing knowledge from others who have uh, been exploring this experience, and you know, other things, just like like working on ourselves, going to therapy, and 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 meditating, and uh, uh, really giving attention to wellness. Then uh, there there is and and as well, like when people arrive on on the ground uh at these at these retreats mm. it always begins with sort of like a like an introduction uh, these are group retreats so usually the group is around 10, 10 people and okay. everyone will int- introduce themselves and kind of get to know each other and and share whatever they feel comfortable sharing about why why they're there what has brought them to this experience and um and then you know there we'll, we'll we'll share like a little bit of of education around the experience, kind of what to expect, uh, what the retreat week looks like, what to expect in the dosing sessions themselves, um, and and sort of just addressing any questions that might be coming up. Uh, so there's that. Then uh, the dosing sessions themselves. So these are these are week long retreats, right? And uh, we offer three dosing sessions, three psilocybin experiences over the course of the week. Each one is separated by a day off. And the dosing sessions themselves, I mean, there's a lot to be said about that, about what's going on there. I mean, it's, it's really, really incredible, incredible to be in, in this, in this psychedelic space with people where, where all, I mean, you really see like the full spectrum of, of the human experience from the, the highest of the highs, just complete you and you know these profound uh, spiritual experiences, mystical experiences that uh, people describe as among the most Im- important and impactful experiences of their entire lives. Um, and that's not just me saying that. You know that's been found as a as a consistent trend in the uh, research that's coming out of a lot of um, a lot of the reputable institutions like Johns Hopkins, Imperial College of London, NYU, and elsewhere. Um, but then, true. I mean, of course there. 
there there it is it is the full spectrum you know so there's like the highest of the highs there's very challenging experiences as well um but they're they're almost almost always uh yielding uh just unbelievably positive uh and and profound effects in moving us toward wellness and towards uh, not just healing but but thriving Hmm. and then after the experience is what what's the outtake kind of experience like right thanks yeah so after each after each dose we'll all gather as a group and uh, again people will share about whatever they feel comfortable sharing about their their experience and you know we'll kind of just discuss like we'll reflect to each other and, and help people to sort of process whatever material has come up whether it's new insights into life career purpose relationships uh, new emotional breakthroughs, whatever kind of emotional content has come up, and as well as you know, what any anything else. A lot of times, people do have these sort of mystical experiences of of encountering something that's felt to be sacred or, or transcendent. Feelings of profound interconnectedness uh, with life, with with nature, with earth, with the natural world. I mean, we're we're doing these retreats in a really really beautiful setting. And uh, so it's not uncommon to to hear that that sort of encounter with the sacred, you know, feeling feeling feelings of profound uh, interconnectivity with with the natural world, with life, uh, and feeling uh, a sense of wellness, you know, a feeling of belonging, a feeling of reconnection uh, that that is profoundly therapeutic and and transformative. Yeah, that that is so, actually one of the things that the research says quite often is that people have these experiences that they will, you know, put in the category of like the top five experiences of their life. You know, it'll be like right, yeah. having kids, getting married, taking mushrooms at one time. You know, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's crazy. And it, and it's not a, it's not like a small percentage either. It's like 60 to 80% of people. I mean, depending on the study that you're looking at, will rank the high dose therapeutic psilocybin experience as among the top five most meaningful and spiritually significant experiences of their entire lives. Like you said, when it like compared to getting married or the birth of a child, I mean, this is like really remarkable stuff. Yeah. So what, what got you into this man? Like what, what was your experience with psychedelics where you said, I, I want to make this such a big part of my life that I help other people do this? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was my first, my first psilocybin trip. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting because like, I was raised, I mean, not necessarily from, from my parents, but more from like society and my, 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 you know, school, my, my education background to kind of view, uh, psychedelics and not just psychedelics, but, but drugs in general, substances in, in, in general with this very stigmatized view. And, and, uh, I really, I really approached with a lot of cynicism and, um, a lot of fear to be honest as well. I mean, this was about 10 years ago. Um, I was, Really not whatsoever interested in psychedelics, but um, yeah, about 10 years ago, my, my uh, friend had some, kind of approached me, said, hey, I'm going to be doing some of these mushrooms, do you want to join? And I was like, yeah, okay, I'll, 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 I'll give it a <laughs> shot, why not? Like, let's, let's, let's try it. I'm, I'm a very curious person by nature and, and uh, always have been curious about the nature of mind and consciousness. Um, and from that very first experience, like it was, it was a life changing experience for me where I immediately intuited, I immediately sensed that all, all the, everything that I had been taught basically about, uh, just this one substance, psilocybin was utter garbage because not only was it not dangerous, it's, it's completely non-toxic and non-addictive, but, uh, this made a really profound impact on my life from the, from the very first, from the very first experience at, at, at the time, you know, I was dealing with, um, relatively high levels of anxiety. I mean, I was in college. I was I was trying to figure out, you know, my career path, my life purpose, and just putting a lot of pressure on myself hmm. uh, to be successful, whatever the whatever the hell that means. Hmm. Um, and and all of a sudden, in this experience, like all of that was just utterly gone. Like the whole narrative, the whole story that I was just constantly, constantly uh, immersed in for you know day in and day out. Uh, it was just all gone. I was just present. In a, I was just aware and present and still in a new way that I hadn't tasted probably since probably since childhood, 
And it was almost effortless. It was just boom. It was there. And then as I was there in this state, I was I was I was going to school in Nashville at the time, and I was in this this park that was kind of overlooking the city. It was a really beautiful spot. I remember just looking around and looking, you know, at all the seemingly mundane things around me, like the the grass I was sitting on, the insects that were flying by, the trees and the clouds passing by, and all of a sudden, just feeling overwhelmed with this sense of awe, like you know that feeling of when you are in a really epic beautiful spot out in nature or you step inside like you know a grand cathedral or something like that and just Mm. this this feeling of awe it was like the best way i can describe it is that it was an encounter with the sacred it was it was one of my first encounters with the sacred and at the time i was i was very much like a materialist i was i was an atheist um never really was interested in in any sort of spiritual aspect of 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 life and existence um and all of a sudden it was just like in this way i couldn't i couldn't really it was very it's still difficult to articulate but i could just sense in life that life is an utter mystery it's utter miracle like every single blade of grass appeared as this you know exquisite and and beautifully patterned uh mystery and you know, everyone was just like walking by, like doing their thing. And I was like, hey, g- hey, guys, do you, t- is anyone else seeing this grass right now? Cause it's really beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but like, um, yeah, no, so it was, th- there was two really big things in that experience. One was that my anxiety was essentially gone. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call this like a, a an, an overnight cure. Like I still had anxiety. I still have anxiety in, in some cases. I mean, it's part of being human, I think, but it just shifted my relationship with anxiety in a really, really profound way. And then also this encounter with the sacred where I felt like it was, my mind had been open to see beyond this just like strictly materialist sort of reductionist uh, way of, of seeing life. And recognizing that this is an astounding mystery and a miracle that we're all part of, that we're all an expression of, and I don't know anything. <laughs> it was like I remember thinking, like, I really do not know anything. And so, like, who am I to, to, to just, like, Im- immediately dismiss, like, some of the more, uh, some of the more you know, spiritual or, or metaphysical ways of, of viewing life and reality. So that, that set me down this whole path. Basically, I became like immediately fascinated by this substance, started doing all the research that I could, um, learning about it, like reading as much of the research as, as, as I, as I could, like I said, and, and, um, yeah, I just became very, very passionate about, about psilocybin and, and uh, DMT and, and other psychedelic substances. One, for their healing capacity. Two, as a tool for exploring the mysteries of life. I have now come to see these substances as essentially like analogous to a technology. like Just in the, just in the same way that we use uh, a telescope to peer more deeply into the cosmos and learn more about reality, I think that... Uh, psychedelics such as psilocybin, DMT, LSD, and others, when used in the proper context in the proper ways, uh, that's really important. Um, when used in the proper context, can uh, serve as a tool, uh, as a telescope for peering inwardly into the nature of mind and consciousness, um, which which goes straight to the heart of of pretty much all of life's greatest mysteries, if you ask me. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just sent me down this this path this path of exploration and. As I began reading more and more of the research and sort of doing more uh, personal exploration for myself, uh, just becoming more and more convinced, uh, more and more uh, passionate, more and more excited about the potential of, of psychedelics. And uh, eventually I, I, I ended up in uh, a social work school a few years, uh, a few years ago. I'm a, a licensed social worker and I was kind of pursuing a, a, a path as a, as a therapist. Um, and just learning, you know, that like uh, when it comes to mental health, we are in need of a breakthrough. The last breakthrough that we've seen when it comes to treating uh, depression, for example, uh, was in the 1980s when SSRIs were were uh, created and, and, and brought to market. SSRIs, like uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like 
these are essentially the gold standard of treating depression these days. There are millions and millions of people across the world who have depression. The gold standard right now for treating depression is SSRIs or other you know, pharmaceutical antidepressants uh, combined with talk therapy. SSRIs are only effective in, in about 30% of people. You know, mm-hmm. and not only that, but it's essentially a band aid. It's symptom management. It's not addressing the root of the problem whatsoever. So, this is why I realized that psilocybin and other psychedelic assisted therapies, this is a quantum leap from where we're at right now. Because all these pharmaceutical drugs, like, I don't mean to just totally like outright dismiss them and, and, and talk badly about them because some people need them to get out of bed and just to just function in the world. And I, I, I totally respect that. Like, you know, do your thing, do whatever you have to do. But at the same time, eventually we have to address the root cause of why that depression is there in the first place. Right. And this is not something that, that, uh, pharmaceuticals can, pharmaceuticals can do. We're on this daily regimen where we're taking these pills every single day. They have all these side effects, right? Right. And uh, that are many of which are very, very unpleasant. Now, compare that to uh, psilocybin assisted therapy where you're taking one or two doses. And instead of symptom management, it's going to the root cause of the issue and actually helping us in a meaningful way heal the source of the issue completely. Well, that's, that's why it's that's, that's really why, interesting. That's why what what yeah, is just yeah. I want to touch on that real quick. What is, in your opinion, the root cause of these you know ailments? Oh, wow, that's a that's a really good question. Um, and uh, for sh- for sure there for sure there's no simple answer, right? I mean, we humans are s- s- such complex beings, and um, there's a there's a there's a whole slew of different answers to that. I mean, books and books and books could be written. Uh, in response to that. And then of course there's significant differences between, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, uh, trauma, uh, adverse childhood experiences. Mm-hmm. One thing is clear, like adverse childhood experiences, it's hard to even though, you know, like one, one, one traumatic experience in early childhood can and will affect us in a deeply embodied way that also, you know, for the most, it can be largely unconscious. Like in some cases, we can't even remember these early childhood events, these early childhood traumas. And yet it's, it's embedded in our nervous system. It's embedded on, on a cellular level. Early childhood experiences can and do affect us for the rest of our lives. Right. So that's one thing. I mean, of course, like, Oh, I, 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 Lucas, I could, I could go on and on about this one because mm-hmm. there, there's so, there's so many different, there's so many different sort of root causes. I think in a, in a big way, uh, a feeling of disconnection, right? A feeling of disconnection from the world, a feeling of disconnection from self, a feeling of disconnection from nature and life, a feeling like I don't belong. Uh, my life here is not meaningful or significant in any way. Uh, that's, uh, that's what I see as, as, as the root of, of a lot of this. But again, like it's hard to just put a little bow tie around this thing and say like that point to it and say, that's what it is. Cause it's very complex. Yeah. And, and I'm totally with you on the, you know, mental health as a science is so sketchy, you know, it's like the whole, it's all theory and, you know, oh, you you, you might have lower levels of this brain chemical, this neurotransmitter. And so we're giving you this drug to raise those levels. There's no actual blood tests you can take where they would, there's nothing objective where they could point to and they could say, hey, you have low levels of this blood marker. And so that's what's making you depressed and we'll give you this drug and it'll raise those levels and now you'll be fine. It's all subjective. It's all kind of made up in some ways. And what interests me about psychedelics is that compared to SSRIs, you know, serotonin is, and I've talked about this in previous podcasts, it it narrows your perception of reality. So in some ways, it's it's more about creating apathy and kind of a sense of not caring. And that's how it kind of goes at right. depression. Whereas right. many of these psychedelics open your perception to different things. And, and whether that's true perception or not, it feels very true. And so it's, it's, it's like a totally different way of approaching the problem, which is what makes me interested in this stuff. Yeah. 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 And, and there is absolutely like that, that neuro, that physiological and neurochemical level to all, all, all these different, uh, mental illnesses as well. Right. And, uh, most of which I, I'm not, I'm not really qualified to, 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 to speak on, but, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so how it's, often, it's, it's um, interesting. How often do you actually take 
psilocybin? Not all that often. Um, I, I would say like no more than once a month. Um, I, you know, it's not like a rule that I have uh, written down somewhere that I, I, I try to keep to. It's really like I follow my intuition on that one. And when I, when I feel ready, when I feel it's time, then I'll revisit. But usually I would say it's about once every two or three months. Um, and, and are you taking like hero doses? I mean, are you going like, you know, straight down into uh, the dark side of the moon? Or are you taking like smaller doses to just kind of feel <laughs> a little bit better? Like, where are you at on that? Yeah, no, I generally take pretty big doses. I mean, I, I've I've been doing this for for a while now, you know, and like I something that I very very I've taken a very very slow and gradual approach to dosing, and I would highly recommend that to anyone who's who's listening who's interested in psilocybin. Like, don't just dive in with a with a super high dose. Um, that's not a good idea whatsoever. I think it is it is advisable in just about every single case to start at a lower dose, um, and uh, you know in in a in a in a good set and setting and in in and um, otherwise you're setting yourself up for uh, potentially unpleasant and really really challenging experience. Um, but yeah, no, I, I mean when I when I dose, I, I do usually dose in in the five to five to ten gram range these days, but. Um, like uh, it is, it is with proper safety precautions in place with, um, ideally with a, f- a friend or, or other people there who can kind of keep an eye on me or, um, you know, like trip sitter who can, uh, hmm. just in case, like, like, like just, just, just in case. Um, what is that just so in yeah. case? Like what would happen? Well, really the main thing is that, uh, physiologically speaking, these things are, are completely non-toxic. They're, they're, they're totally safe from a physiological point of view. And yet sometimes in the experience, it can actually feel like you are dying (laughs) and that feels convincingly real. Or in some cases it can feel like you are 100% losing your mind. Like, okay, I've just taken way too many mushrooms. My mind is gone. I've done irreparable damage. They're going to have to send me away to, to the insane asylum. Like I am completely Effed, you know mm. and like it can be all in, in, in some cases a sense of uh uncertainty about what is real and what's not real right and so to have someone there who is sober who is aware who can kind of just reassure you you're you're on mushrooms right now you're not dying you're not going crazy this will pass in just a few hours, you'll be back down. And, and, and also as well, like, you know, in these situations, and this has happened to me a couple of times where you're not a hundred percent sure what is the reality of the situation. Like maybe something happens or someone says something to you and you're uh, interpreting a meaning to those words or your, or that event that, that is completely convoluted and not, and not true. Um, and and yet can be very fear inducing. I mean, just as one example, there was a mushroom trip I had where I thought uh, someone was really really upset with me and and like to the point of being furious and wanting to fight me. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out that was not the case whatsoever. Like not the case whatsoever. And having someone there to sort of talk me down, like they don't want to fight you. Like you completely misunderstood the whole situation. Everything is fine. Um, that was really really. It was just. I can't tell you how how relieving it it was it was to hear that and to realize oh yeah I'm on, I'm on mushrooms and just because my mind is thinking it and telling me like this is a hundred percent real doesn't mean it is but you know in some cases like it, the it, very extreme example of that is that someone can put themselves in harm's way right they can leave a safe space they can put themselves in in harm's way uh, do something that that is you know engage in in risky behavior. Um, and that has happened, you know, and so like, that's really the, the very extreme case of, of, um, why having a trip sitter there is, is important to, to, to just absolutely ensure, um, safety, safety and well being. Um, okay. One thing I heard, uh, from this Jordan Peterson podcast from this researcher is that they tell their patients who are taking this, you know, if you see something very scary, like if a demon is coming towards you and and you're scared out of your mind to take the approach of just observing. You're just there to observe. And if you start to run away from that fear, that fear will just grow. And 
it will be like this trip of running away from the demons and the fear in your mind. But if you take an approach of uh, observing and, you know, thinking, wow, this is very interesting. This is, you know, almost curiosity that you can kind of get through those experiences much better. Is that something you, you guys are kind of using? Oh, absolutely. Very well said. Yeah, yeah, very well said. I mean, that, that that's that's exactly it. When it comes to the psychedelic experience, there's no... There's no going around. There's going through. It's not. It's not. We can't. We can't run away from these things. We we have to. We have to move. We have to move through the experience. And almost always on the other side, like there there is a great a great treasure, a great revelation waiting to waiting to be received. I mean, Joseph Campbell has this quote where he says, like, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. In the psychedelic experience, I I mean, this is kind of more the mystical side of me speaking rather than the scientific, but. I believe that there is a reason why these things are coming up. Like I, I after having worked with with psychedelics for you know the in the past years of my life in a very intensive way, I it's almost like these substances have an intelligence to them, where where they're doing a full scan of the system on every level, mental, uh, physical, emotional, spiritual, and pinpointing the key issues to serve us up an experience that is most conducive to our growth and evolution. If there is fear or anxiety coming up, why is that there? It's pointing to some aspect. It's pointing to some dynamic within us. And almost always, like, and this is something I've observed within myself as well as with um, other guests who, who have come through the retreat center is that, you know, a lot of times when anxiety is, is rising within the body, like during these psychedelic experiences, Beneath that anxiety, there is a, a a raw there's a reservoir of of some sort of emotionality. Some something is starting to come up, right? That is maybe too overwhelming or painful or challenging or difficult to 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 look at. You know, a lot of times these childhood or or uh, not necessarily just childhood trauma, but just trauma in general is is it can be excruciatingly painful and terrifying to look at. And yet, through this simple uh, non-judgmental observation, just rather than trying to fight it or shove it down or push it away like we've done the whole rest of our lives, taking this different approach of just opening to it non-judgmentally, allowing it to move with this kind of open curiosity, this is how we heal. This is how we get our breakthroughs. This is how we level up. This is how we literally evolve as beings and, and move towards uh, self-actualization. And like, yeah, I mean, you can, you can see this all, all, all the time. Like in, in, there was this one, there was this one retreat where a guest who was, you know, really terrified of, of, of snakes had a vision of snakes while he was, uh, sort of in the, the psilocybin experience. And he was encouraged rather than trying to like escape or run away from these snakes to just like sort of like exposure therapy, you know, like just gently one, one step at a time, like, uh, uh, allow it to be there first of all, then see if you can, you know, take one little baby step closer and closer and, and almost befriend this thing. And like, as he did that, the snake just shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and eventually turned into a egg and then out popped this, like, uh, there was just all, all, all types of, of, insights and revelations that came out of that experience for him, you know? Mm. So this is the way the way is always through. It's not to escape. It's not to go around. And that's a, that's a life lesson. That's a powerful life lesson that, uh, uh, we can know on a conscious level, but doesn't mean that we're living that truth because it's really hard to live that truth. But I always compare it to like a, uh, you know, kind of this 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 old cliche of of go with the flow. Like it really does apply to uh, the psychedelic experience, and I always compare the psychedelic experience to like this flowing river. And us as the psychedelic explorers, we're like a, a on a on a kayak or on a canoe on the surface of the river. Some people are trying really hard to row upstream, you know, and that's just not the way to go because mm. you're gonna, not going to have a good time. You're going to have uh, it, it's going to be really challenging. And you're not you're not gonna get very far. And even if you do, the river is still flowing. Eventually, it's gonna carry you in that other direction. So, um, and then not only that, some people are literally cursing the direction of the river. Right? <laughs> They're like, "How rivers rivers flowing that way? Like, I want it to move that way." It's like, "Sorry, buddy, that's not how it works." So, really, what uh, the the art of 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 psychedelic exploration is 
um, like being that kayaker on that river, you know, and knowing how to gracefully navigate uh, the the ebbs and flows and 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 to go with the flow and um, that will always carry us in an amazing direction. So is there a certain personality type or maybe people who've been through trauma or something who might be more prone to like having one of these scarier experiences or, you know, feel, feeling like they're going to die or something like that? That's a really good question as well. I, I, it's, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, again, this, this is really, really complex. I mean, we're dealing with human beings here, right? So like, there's just so much to be said. Um, I think that one, one, one trend that I, I've noticed is that people who are very much like, like type A and, and very much like needing to uh, maintain a sense of control in, in, in all aspects of life. They're always trying to control the outcomes for everything because they think that's going to save them from, I don't know, like um, uh, unpleasant experiences. Sure, bad things happening. Um, Right, exactly. But I mean, that's not really the case anyway, right? Like, 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 you know, bad things happen to good people all the, all the time. And anyway, I mean, I, th- I think what I have noticed is that people who are like very type A and also people who have, um, who are very much in, in their minds, in their thoughts all the time, who don't, who don't really have any familiarity with inner stillness with, uh, with presence uh, with meditation, with with uh, cultivating a state of being centered and grounded, you know, I mean that looks different for 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 everyone. Um, but again, it's like like you said, that sort of that state of of non judgmental observation. That's that's really it, right? But what does it mean to non judgmentally observe? In order for that to happen, uh, there needs to be inner silence. The mind, to some degree needs to uh or even if even if thoughts are swirly and going out of control does that person have any experience with uh tapping into a deeper dimension of themselves of, ju- of just awareness itself being aware of these thoughts that 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 are all swirling around and not judging that you know uh other pe- there there are some people who are just so constantly like in this monkey mind who are always sort of uh engaged with with thought and who are completely identified with the thinking mind then it becomes very very hard to come out of the story of what's going on to come out of this you know like impulsive and and like compulsive uh judging and analyzing of every single thing that's happening right like it's Mm -hmm. easy it's easy to say like non-judgmentally observe but then what does that mean in practice like in an embodied state it requires some aspect of inner stillness, right? Or, or, or presence. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that answers your question. Like it's, it's, it's a, it's a difficult, it's something I think about a lot. Um, and I think for sure there are certain personality types who like, you know, there are certain personalities who even in a, even in a difficult situation, they're looking for the life lesson. You know, it's this idea of like no mistakes, only lessons. Uh, there are some people who like some 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 difficulty will happen in in the in the experience and then they're just going down this this rabbit hole of frustration or anger or 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 uh feeling upset feeling miserable and sorry for themselves then there's other people like there was a guy on on uh one of the last retreats i worked who was on a pretty high dose and like while he was you know in the peak of the experience he got stung by a bee right on his face <laughs> wow and like uh you know like there you can there's a lot of different directions to take that like one way you can either be completely miserable and and hate your life i mean it's it's pretty it's pretty unfortunate that this happened uh because he's come all the way to have this mushroom experience and then he gets stung right on the face while he's in the middle of his trip but you know i mean he saw it as a lesson he got so much out of that experience right so like what is what is that dis- distinction there i mean some people are more able to uh I, I, I see it I, like the image that comes to mind again is this kayaker going down the river. It's like you're navigating the boulders that come come in your way. Like you see the boulder and like maybe maybe, you know, some people somehow have that that uh, resilience, like a level of inner resilience or a level of, of, of wisdom, presence, mindfulness, awareness. Um, these things serve very, very well in the psychedelic experience. So do you think that people are actually seeing something like a, a different dimension? Like, do you think they're actually going somewhere or is it 
kind of all in their head? You know, is it like an illusion that maybe points to the truth? This is a really interesting question. Um, I, I think the answer is yes, <laughs> meaning both. Um, and it, and it, and it really, really dep- depends. I mean, this is ultimately, this is, this is getting to the deeper philosophical question of what ultimately is truth and what is real. Right. And like, maybe we don't have to go all the way that far in the, in this discussion, cause many books have been written on that, but, sure. um, you know, j- just saying like, is this bringing us closer to truth or is this bringing us further away from truth and t- towards illusion? Right. And, and absolutely, I think both can happen. And I, I believe that I've experienced both happening. Like in that situation I told you where I thought this guy was furious with me, that wasn't the truth of the situation whatsoever. Hmm. At the same time, it does seem that psychedelic experiences can unveil incredibly profound insights into the nature of consciousness, the nature of reality, the nature of mind, and the human condition. Uh, Aldous Huxley, who wrote uh, The Doors of Perception, presented this really interesting idea that, that said, the brain is a reducing valve, right? Like, we have evolved this way, the brain has evolved this way in order to help us survive, right? Like at any given time, we're, we're just overloaded with sensory data with all these inputs and the brain essentially filters out only the most relevant and useful information so that we're not walking into a street and getting hit by a car, right? Like this is an important survival mechanism. But at the same time, like there's all this sensory data that's coming in at all, all the time and, and basically what what Huxley was saying in Doors of Perception was that psychedelics open up these doors of perception. They, they expand this, this reducing valve so that uh, it just gets bigger and bigger and more and more information uh, uh, comes in and we're, be- we're becoming more and more aware. And this is when, you know, my comparison of psychedelics to a, a telescope, it's like when we're using a telescope, this isn't a, a normal human uh, faculty to see like uh, millions of miles in, in, into into the cosmos, and yet that's regarded as as real and relevant and and meaningful data that is bringing us closer to truth. I think in the same way, uh, this sort of telescope or microscope inwardly into our inner world absolutely can reveal uh, fundamental truths. And what you and and one you know further uh, defense of that position is the degree of consensus among people, namely among people who have had these mystical type experiences, right? Like all over the world, no matter what sociocultural religious background the individual is from, no matter what time period they've lived in, all the mystics in the world, whether they've accessed these mystical experiences through meditation, through yoga, through psychedelics, through spiritual practice, they're all reporting the exact same fundamental things, which include one, uh, interconnectedness of all things, a fundamental unity to life and existence, the transcendence of consciousness, the insight that consciousness is non-local. It's not just some epiphenomenon that's produced, not just some emergent property that's produced by the physical interaction of the brains. Consciousness is actually fundamental to life and reality and, exist- and existence itself. Uh, that space and time are illusory. They're not fundamental to reality itself. They're a human experience. They're a human perception. All these different things uh, are reported by mystics all all over the world. Again, whether or not they, they've accessed these mystical experiences through psychedelics, through meditation, or other spiritual practice. And what's even more interesting is now like in, in uh, the 21st century or even in the 20th, 20th century, going back to the discovery of quantum physics, right? Like modern science, the most cutting edge science is now validating all these things that mystics have said. Quantum physics is telling us, oh, yeah, when we go down to the subatomic level, uh, it's true. There is only oneness. This unified field, this unified quantum field of energy and potential out of which all of this supposedly material world uh, uh, has emerged from, it's there. At all times, there is an underlying unity and oneness to all things, going back to the Big Bang when everything started as this unified ball of energy a billion times smaller than a single atom, (laughs) right? And, like, uh, that's true. These things have been scientifically validated and empirically proven, and non-local consciousness this is another thing that is you know emerging out of out of quantum physics and it's still very contested and and very much debated and there's a lot of different theories of consciousness but i am absolutely convinced that 
uh, this is the direction of of the future of of quantum physics and 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 science in general. Like a a a revolution of science where we discover that consciousness is much more mysterious is much more mysterious than anything that we've even begun to to discover and that actually maybe it is fundamental but it's interesting that like all of these people who are under the influence of psychedelics such as psilocybin and dmt and ayahuasca have these experiences of unity of oneness of transcendence of space and time of encountering aspects of reality that are felt to be divine or transcendent or spiritual and knowing that this life that we are this expression of life that we are is ultimately one it's unified with the the entire infinite totality mm-hmm. right so like this is a this is that's a that's a very long <laughs> long-winded answer to your question of yes both both are happening like in some cases uh we are we can get lost in these psychedelic experiences that feel very illusory and and maybe they are illusory. Maybe there's not much truth to them, but then in other cases, there are absolutely cases where there's this, these, these states of expanded awareness of expanded perception of the unveiling of fundamental truths that are bringing us closer to, to truth, to, to, to the reality of, of this mystery of life. I, I do think that that is really interesting that, you know, there are, there is so much commonality in uh, many religious experiences from around the globe. Um, but I, I think what most people are worried about is, you know, having a bad trip or is this going to alter me in some way that, you know, I'm I'm not going to be the same afterwards, and it's going to be in a bad way. So l- let me tell you my concerns, and you tell me whether this makes sense or not. So I, you know, my early 20s and mid-20s, and well, kind of getting into my late 20s too, uh, I was very much into the spiritual scene. I went to India for a while, and, you know, for a couple months, and, and just stayed in an ashram. Um, I took meditation classes all the time where they would, you know, feed you just barely anything, you know, vegetable broth with some veggies and stuff, and you'd meditate for eight, 10 hours a day. And during those experiences, I I mean, I had very mystical, you know, trippy kind of things happen. I remember one time I was dancing and I I just felt like the world was, the universe was dancing with me and I could actually like feel it on my skin, like moving with me as I danced. And, Mm. And so it was just, I had these really profound experiences and at the same time, I think there were drawbacks to that. Mainly, I was in my mid-20s, and, and I remember this yogi guy asking me one time, you know, what do you want? What do you want out of life? You can have anything. What do you want? And I just said, I was so in this space of like, of love and openness and, you know, universal connection that I just was like, I, I don't want anything. I, I have no desires whatsoever right now. Now, mm-hmm. I got out of that and... I started working and and kind of coming back to the world and being like, okay, I got to, you know, provide for myself. And looking back on that, I think, you know, a 25-year-old shouldn't be saying that they want nothing. Like there is something about being human when you're, you know, when you're 25, you should have desires. You should want to have a family. You should want to, you know, there are things that are healthy for you to do to to kind of see the other side of life. Um uh, Carl Jung has that saying, you know, beware of unearned wisdom, uh, which is kind of like almost putting putting the cart before the horse. And so one thing I, I worry about with the psychedelics is do they kind of open you up in a way, like forcefully open you up? And does that, you know, hurt your motivation to do things in life? Does that, um, yeah, yes, you feel good and wonderful and connected, but are you now less likely to then try and learn something from the traumatic things in your past. And so, I don't, I don't know, these are kind of some of the thoughts in my head when I think about psychedelics. And it's just part of the reason why I've stayed away from them a little bit in that I think, you know, I'm already kind of on the verge of openness. I'm already making connections in life that don't, you know, you know that uh, personality trait openness, which is really... Um, it's really uh, prevalent in very creative people where you make connections in the world with things that aren't very connected. And sometimes that's, you know, nothing. And other times that's beautiful art. I'm already on the verge of that. And so I think, you know, pushing beyond that, you know, taking psychedelics and going farther, maybe that isn't such a great idea. You know, maybe that would hurt my motivation. Maybe I would become more passive. I I don't know. Maybe I I would be happier, but I would do less in life. Does that, does any of that make sense? Has that been 
your experience at all in dealing with people at this uh, at this Jamaica facility? That's a yeah. Uh, that's a really really interesting question, and and absolutely that does make sense. Well, for, first let me start by saying that one in all the research that's been done, you know, there have been dozens and dozens of clinical trials, uh, hundreds of 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 participants at the at this point. There has not been one case that's been reported so far of any lasting adverse uh, reactions in terms of in pretty much in pretty much any any respect, right? In terms of like this destabilizing effect mm. on, on their life. I'm not saying that's not possible. I'm saying that's that's credit to the adequate amount of screening because not everyone is in a place in their life right now to benefit from these experiences. It's also credit to the adequate amount of support before, during, and after the experience. And this is why, you know, the role of psychedelic facilitator exists so that we can help to promote positive outcomes where we're moving towards self-actualization, right? Where we're moving towards thriving. And yeah, I mean, integration, this, this sort of after the experience piece is so, so fundamental, right? And, and I mean, that looks different for a lot of different people. Um, but you know, this, this idea of, uh, one, I'm not, I'm not going to be the same, uh, in some way, in some ways I would, I would argue that that's actually a good thing. Like there's, there's, there's parts of people are coming to this experience because there's parts of us that are no longer serving us, that are holding us back, that, that are wounded, that we want to let go, that we want to, it's like the snake shedding its skin. You know, it's, 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 it's the caterpillar who is metamorphosizing in, into the butterfly, um, certain aspects need to die off in order for us to uh, reach our fullest potential and, 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 and self-actualize. Um, the question of motivation, I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And I, and I think that, again, like this is a very nuanced thing where everyone is going to have different, uh, different responses and different interpretations of that question because it really depends on what we value. You know, what, what, it, what, what is it that we, we value as individuals? Uh, what, what is it that we, that self-actualization, that thriving, that realizing our fullest potential, what does that look like? And that's different for, for everyone. And in some cases that, uh, in some cases, motivation is, is very, very deeply tied to that of, uh, accomplishing certain things of seeing certain, certain things and experiencing certain things in other cases that may not be the case whatsoever. I mean, if you look at any any life form that's on planet Earth, apart apart from a human, uh, there are some degree of motivations, right? But like that life form expressing itself to its fullest potential, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, having X dollars in the bank account or doing X, Y, or Z, or you know, seeing the other side of the, of the planet or or, or whatever, mm-hmm. right? So there there this question of 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 life meaning of life purpose. Um, is 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 very much intertwined into the psychedelic experience, and of course, very much intertwined into this idea of self actualization. But really, I, I mean, I think the key takeaway here for me is that having an adequate amount of support uh, throughout the experience, and certainly in the integration phase after the experience, having someone who uh, has the experience, who has a level of wisdom, who really cares and is really compassionate about about our growth. Um, to have someone there to, or multiple people there to reflect back to us, to make sure that we are leveraging this situ, this this experience into into positive growth, into uh, um, into positive transformation is so so important because that process can be really really confusing, very disorienting, very overwhelming, and very challenging to know which way to go for us as individuals. I think there is an argument to be made that. If someone realizes that they are in a state of desirelessness, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? I, I mean, if you look at, at a lot of the um, – and it's also – I will also say that that's not incompatible with motivation because uh, someone can be um, – and I, I actually think that this is the culmination of spiritual wisdom and this is the culmination of self-actualization where we have done the self-work to the extent – where we feel at peace within ourselves already. We're not going about in life to try to, you know, 
arrange the circum, fix all our problems, arrange all the circumstances of life so that everything is just perfect, that we have the job and the career and, the, and, and X, Y, and Z so that finally we are, we like the outer world is perfect and everything is, ha- that's not realistic. It's not part of the, that's what, you know, the Buddhists call the, the path of samsara. You can look in the outer world for as long as you want for that lasting sense of peace and fulfillment, but ultimately <laughs> you're not going to find it. Mm. It, it. It begins with, it begins within, right? It begins within always, always, always. This is the human condition. Um, and so to find our way to that place where we have, where we're in touch with that, that inner that self-awareness, that inner knowledge, that inner wisdom, that presence, that awareness, where we can feel at peace within ourselves here and now, here and now, that is not contingent on the external world appearing in a certain way. And yet, just because we're in that place where we feel deeply at peace with ourselves, that doesn't mean that we're going to sit on the couch for the rest of our lives, hmm. right? Like, uh, we're, then, then I believe this again this is self actualization then i believe that we're opening up to actually deeper uh levels of motivation that aren't that aren't being pressured or driven by all these sort of artificial social constructs and all these you know like ridiculous uh, uh just 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 human illusion basically just just human misperceptions of the situation mm-hmm. uh in which we find ourselves uh, so then it's coming from a deeper place within us, from life itself, from our heart. It's coming from the heart and, and we're getting in touch with our own, like authentic, intuitive, uh, embodied and deeply felt, uh, passions and, and feelings of, of excitement and joy, you know, and, and we're being driven by those motivations rather than the ones that have been programmed into our brains, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's a different, it's a different, but I think those two things are compatible, mm-hmm. right? So one thing I wanted to touch on before we start wrapping it up is uh, just the difference between psilocybin and other psychedelics, uh, things like peyote, LSD, ayahuasca. I actually uh, read something one time on Twitter from, I want to say it was Mike Cernovich. I don't know who it was, but it, they said that psilocybin is kind of like being hugged by, uh, you know, a loving universe where ayahuasca is like being lectured from an angry god um can you maybe speak to a little bit of the difference between all of these ayahuasca has plenty of hugs to give (laughs) (laughs) ayahuasca's got a lot of hugs and love to give but uh also for sure it can be a stern teacher as well um i don't have nearly as much experience with with ayahuasca as i do with psilocybin so I'll, i'll i'll say that and um yeah, there. This is another question where there's there's a lot to be said because a, a, every single substance is 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 unique, right? Um, there are some commonalities, there are some similarities. Like for example, um, there are shifts in perception, uh, and an altered sense of of space and time, an altered sense of self. Um, in some cases. Uh, there, there, there are new ways of, of thinking and perceiving the world. Basically, it's a non-ordinary state of consciousness, and and in non-ordinary states of consciousness, all our modes of perception and experience are altered. They're different. They feel different. It feels different to be, uh, and that's 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 constant through you know all of all of these these psychedelic substances. Um, there are notable notable differences as well. You know, like. Uh, DMT is one of the NN dimethyltryptamine. Uh, there's another one called 5-MeO DMT. Mm. These are generally generally regarded as the two most powerful psychedelic substances on the face of the planet, and they differ significantly from uh, psilocybin and uh, LSD and uh, others in the sense, uh, you know, in in a number of different respects. One, um, just in terms of duration like duration of the experience. Interestingly enough, DMT and 5-MeO DMT, like the molecular compound is actually very, very similar in its structure to, to psilocybin as well as serotonin, which is, which is, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of like the duration of the experience, uh, DMT and then DMT and 5-MeO DMT both only last about 15 minutes. Uh, the onset is super, super rapid. So like you inhale, uh, some of this vapor, like a vaporized crystal, essentially, and within a few heartbeats, like within a few seconds, 
it just comes on so fast like a wave and it's like uh oh lucas you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get me going and going man <laughs> <laughs> once i once i once i start talking about this stuff I'll, I'll 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 just keep on going but uh yeah no i mean uh 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 dmt i brought up in particular because like uh, the, these two DMTs are, are 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 very very unique. They offer these experiences that are generally regarded as out of body experiences. They're generally described as it subjectively feels as though consciousness awareness uh, separates from the physical body, uh, moves through some sort of uh, tunnel or or portal, and emerges in some sort of uh, alternate realm or dimension of existence, a transcendent realm or dimension of existence. I also don't mean to like compare five meo and nn DMT as like they're one and the same because they're certainly not. They're the similarity is in their uh, duration and onset, and their molecular structure is similar. Five meo DMT is generally regard is generally described as like sort of dissolving into this uh, infinite light. Like infinite, like the source of life itself, the source of life itself from which everything has emerged, dissolving into that. Like th- this is sort of nirvana type experience. Five M uh, E, sorry, N N D M T. Uh, sometimes those 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 experiences are described as well, but N N D M T is just this remarkable and strange uh, uh, experience where it feels as though you arrive in some sort of transcendent realm or dimension of experience that is full of uh color it's full of light uh there are entities in these in these spaces it's very bizarre almost everyone who has these experiences reports these entity encounters where they're in these all these non-ordinary realms of existence these transcendent realms of existence beyond the physical universe outside of space and time and they're they are inhabited they're populated by these other beings who we can commune with and uh actually uh relate to and uh it's just very 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 strange how frequently that's that's reported to make that mystery even stranger nndmt is uh one of the only psychedelic compound as far as i know it's the only psychedelic compound that we know of that's endogenously produced in the human body this is a great mystery nndmt is within every single one of us right now at this yeah, moment small, small amounts Not only- right in, tr- in trace quantities, yep, in very small amounts, but it's there. And in every single mammalian species that's been tested so far, it's been found that they also contain trace amounts of DMT. That they na- their or their physiology naturally produces that. It's found in thousands of different plant and animal species. Common grass contains trace trace uh, quantities <laughs> of of DMT. It's it's remarkable from an evolutionary perspective. We have absolutely no idea why that's the case. We have no idea what physiological uh, purpose it serves in, in in our bodies. Why it's there, even though in a in a 2019 study that I think was out of like University of Michigan or something, they found that DMT uh, occurs in the in the human organism at a similar rate to serotonin, which we know how important serotonin is. In, in regulating so many different bodily functions, right? So, like, this is a great mystery. Why is the arguably the single most powerful psychedelic substance on the earth, why is it naturally produced in the human body, and why is it found all throughout the natural world? Um, really, really interesting stuff. But I, I've kind of gone off the rails a little bit from your <laughs> it's question. It's all right, but, man. That's, uh, that's probably a good area to start wrapping it up. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah. I'll just ask you this as a final question. Um I, I usually like to ask my guests this question if there's time, but uh, you know, given what you know about psychedelics and stuff, is there any advice you see out there, uh, health advice or whatever, that you think, man, that's just the worst thing that you could do? Yes, um, the the worst advice I could think of is people saying that there's no risks. Um, people who are, uh, you know, trying to, um, and and I have to check myself on this sometimes too. You know, like. People who are presenting this as like, you, you know, like the way of the future, let me say I absolutely am 100% convinced that this will revolutionize the field of mental health in a fundamental way and that this is the way of the future. Um, however, 
people need to have authentic and honest conversations about the risks that are involved as well. In every single psychiatric medication and pharmaceutical intervention on the planet, there are risks, there are adverse effects, there are, you know, potential potential risks. And so that's a conversation that needs to be had as well. And, and, and people need to be aware of this. And um, it's important that people are, are promoting these things and, and spreading awareness. And I mean, that's something that <laughs> I'm doing, con- I'm doing constantly. But as well, like there, there are there are certain people who are not in a position to benefit from 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 this substance. For example, I'll just say um, people who have uh, uh, bipolar, uh, people who have any kind of of uh, psychosis or schizophrenia or, or psychotic like features symptoms, um, psychedelic substances can trigger an episode. A, a either a manic episode, for example, or or a psych- psychotic uh, episode that uh, lasts uh, days or even weeks after the effects of the 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 substance itself have 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 worn off and and left the body. Right. So it's just things like that. Like people need to be aware of these things, and that requires a a level of screening. Right. Like not to play ge- gatekeeper like that's not something i'm interested in doing it's but what i am interested in doing is making sure that everyone is well and healthy um and really like ultimately at the end of the day uh this entire psychedelic movement right now is poised in this incredible position where it it may it just might revolutionize the future of mental health care however uh we saw what happened in the 60s and 70s right there was this like psychedelic craze and and like everyone was super excited about it. All the psych- psychiatrists and psychologists were researching is, this stuff and saying it's the future. And it all got shut down because people weren't uh, responsible in the ways that they were using and promoting these substances. And so like what what do we learn from 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 that time period if we want to avoid that like, you know, cultural backlash that uh, of, of all this being shutting down, shut, shut down again then we need to navigate, we need to move forward in a very, very tactful way. Uh, and that requires having an appreciation of, of the risks uh, that are involved. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. Uh, how can people get in contact with you? How can they find your work? You know, are you working on anything coming up that you want to let people know about? Yeah, thanks for asking. So uh, I recently started a company uh, called Intervision Psychedelics. Uh, It's a psychedelic consulting company. I offer education and support around the psychedelic experience, around all aspects of the psychedelic experience, as well as integration coaching. Um, And I also have a YouTube channel called Cosmic Consciousness with Jonas, where I make videos about psychedelics, about consciousness, about a bunch of different topics. Um, So either of those ways would be the best way to find me. Awesome. Well, I will have those links in the show notes. And dude, thanks for coming on. It's been an awesome conversation. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I'm really thankful to Jonas for coming on and discussing this topic, which is uh, pretty controversial. Um, there are you know, many different strongly held beliefs uh, behind psilocybin and, and other psychedelics. So I've been asking myself if medicinal mushrooms have a place in healing. And the first conclusion I come to is, is no doubt that they do. You know, they are powerful. Uh, the research is showing astounding benefits, but you know that research is just getting started on how to use these substances properly. So the actual details on who they are best for and who they're not good for, how they should be used, well, that's pretty unclear. I mean, as you heard Jonas say, you know, he, he's thought a lot about what types of people may have bad trips and whether there's a personality to those type of people or, or some kind of background. So there's still a lot to discover here. But psilocybin is very powerful and it definitely is positively benefiting people with mental health problems, at least compared to other interventions. Now, in the interview, I expressed my concern about spiritual experiences like the types that I have had when in India and in meditation classes. And perhaps those spiritual experiences may be hurting someone's motivation. And if psilocybin gives you these same semi-spiritual experiences, could psilocybin hurt motivation? And this this concern in part uh, came from the Carl Jung saying about psychedelics, uh, beware of unearned wisdom. So let's talk about that. Let's let's take that apart. Uh, why beware? You know, why, what did he mean? What 
What is the danger there? So first off, wisdom, it's an embodied learning. It means that your body and your mind are knowing some truism or some fact at the same time. So for example, you may know intellectually that delaying gratification is a good thing, but it is only wisdom when it becomes a part of your everyday life. When, when you just know in your bones that after breakfast, you're going to do the hardest things on your to-do list first, and then you're going to leave the easier things until later. That's wisdom. It's, it's a combination between your mind and your body. Now, part of the danger comes from the fact that wisdom often has an element of discernment that is needed between opposites, that this is kind of the whole Eastern duality thing. So delaying gratification, it has an opposite piece of wisdom, which would say, live for today. Let tomorrow take care of itself. Enjoy this moment because you never know when you're going to die. Just live free. Be here. Be, be in the now. Now that is just as true as delaying gratification. And good discernment is knowing when those different sayings apply to life. So when Jung says, beware of unearned wisdom, part of that danger is you will not have the experience to properly discern how to use that wisdom. So that's, that's the first thing. The next thing is, from what Jonas said and the Jordan Peterson podcast said, it seems that psilocybin is a shortcut to deep wisdom on the connectedness of all life. Uh, When I asked Jonas what he thought was the core issue with anxiety and depression, he said disconnection, the, the sense that you're alone and isolated, and psilocybin gets to the heart of this. And it does this by giving an experience that feels true into the depths of your soul, from what he's saying. Uh, it's not like a movie where you're watching a spectacle, you know, you're watching Gladiator or Braveheart or some other movie, uh, but you know that after it's done, as wild and amazing as it might have been, you're going to go back to your regular life. No, uh, psilocybin, it hits you in a deeper way, uh, and all the research backs that up. Now, one of the most startling things that the research reports is that people who have a psilocybin experience have a change to their personality called trait openness that seems to be permanent, meaning it is still there months and years later. Uh, I believe that change was maybe one standard deviation move towards more openness. I could be wrong about that, but I think it's somewhere in that uh, realm. Now, openness is one of the big five personality traits. So those who score high on the openness scale, they tend to be imaginative, curious, open-minded. They like trying new things. They like seeking out new experiences. As you may be able to tell from this podcast, I have a lot of openness in my personality. I'm always trying new things. Now, at the opposite end of the scale, individuals who score low on openness, they tend to be pragmatic, uh, data-driven. Uh, They don't seek new experiences. They may optimize what they already know. And neither one of these sides of the scale is good or bad. They each have different strengths. And and one of the reasons that I focus so much on pragmatism in this podcast, why I'm always saying, you know, how does this affect you in real life, is because I know that one of the weaknesses of being an open person like myself is getting lost in imagination. It's, It's making connections that seem interesting in the mind. Um, it's making, you know, it's, it's getting lost in your creation uh, and it isn't really real. So I'm always asking myself, you know, how does this actually get used in real life? How, do, how does the rubber meet the road? Anyway, psilocybin, it seems to engender a shift towards openness in people that is permanent or semi-permanent. So it's giving people very real experiences that are changing how they see themselves and the world. Now, the danger is that in what they see, the old things that they believed could be swept aside, meaning wisdom destroys your previous axioms and assumptions to a certain extent, which can leave you unbalanced and adrift, and this may rob you of motivation and experience. So here's, here's an analogy to better explain this. Let's take an old man. I hope this isn't corny, but here we go. Let's take an old man in his 70s who has lived a true life, and he's reflecting on that life, let's say. 
So when, when he was young, he was a fisherman in the northern seas of Canada and Scandinavia. Uh, he went from port to port, making new friends, uh, falling in love with different women, uh, learning about life. And over time, he bonded with people uh, from many different walks, and he grew to love familiar places on the sea. He loved the sea. Uh, he found a woman as well who he cherished and wanted to make his wife. Until one day, his best friend and mentor, who he had fished with for over 10 years, and had a little bit of a problem with the sauce, with the alcohol. Well, he betrayed him by sleeping with his fiance. Now, the man, he swore revenge. But in a twist of fate, that same friend, the best friend, was killed in a fishing accident a week later. And this showed the man, the man truly loved his best friend, even despite his betrayal. And so all his rage was turned into bitter sadness. Now, this experience was so distraught, he eventually made his way to Africa, where he flew a private plane for uh, wealthy clients. And, you know, wealthy clients in Africa sometimes mean means violent clients. And so his plane, they it gathered some bullet holes now and then. And sometimes he had to pick up a gun himself as well to make sure that they made it off the runway. But he was always able to make it to his destination, and he survived. And he lived like that for many years until he met another woman who helped him heal from the violence and betrayal that had characterized his life up until then. And now he's in his 70s. Uh, he's reflecting on his life. He lives in Australia with this woman and their two kids who are, who are a bit older. They're getting ready to move out. And uh, he runs a gold prospecting business. And he sells, you know, the proverbial picks and shovels to young men and women hoping to strike gold in Australia in the, in the gray outback. Now, as this man reflects on his life, he sees that things he once cared deeply for, they no longer seem to matter like they once did. In contrast, things that he paid no mind to at the time uh, of the event, they ended up being some of the most cherished memories he has. I mean, he has had desires that gripped his heart. He's had failures, successes, uh, depression, euphoria. Um, he has scars, like he lost a pinky finger in a, from a badly tied knot on a boat. But across this entire journey, he now sees the oneness of all life. He sees that while, you know, nothing stays the same and life is always changing, there is a deep connection across all time and space. In the anxieties that he felt, the conflict, uh, the deep emotions, none of them were very real. They're all gone. Uh, but what he feels now is a deep sense of gratitude for his life, an overarching wonder and awe at this just amazing creation of God that he's been able to experience. Now, in my mind, this little story, which I made up, is the archetypal journey that brings you to the place of awe. Psilocybin seems to give you this feeling without having to actually go through these experiences. It, it's like it almost opens your personality up without you having a closed personality first and then having the experiences that then open that personality. And if it just gives you that experience, if it just opens that personality without the work, well, Maybe you won't live a life like this nameless man lived. Deprivation begets motivation. I mean, I, I hate to say it, it's probably not the most motivating statement, but deprivation begets motivation. What you don't have tends to motivate you. And the old man, he lived this imaginary life because of his desires, his anger, his depression, anxiety. Yes, in the end, he saw the fruitlessness of much of that. He gained peace. But without the journey, without the hardship, he doesn't go to Africa or Australia or any of those adventures. So would psilocybin, by giving you peace, awe, and wonder, would it take something away from you as well? Would it take away the experience of gaining those? I think that's where the risk is. But on the other hand, not everyone lives the life of that old man in the story. Some people are trapped in a small windowless apartment, uh, depressed out of their mind, working a job they hate. You know, for that person, more time, it's not going to probably bring much wisdom or awe. <laughs> it's probably going to be a lot more misery and nihilism. 
One thing I didn't uh, mention in the interview about these experiences that I had over in India was that when I came back from India, a lot of the beliefs had dropped away from me, but one became very strong. I mean, I, I felt like I really did grow up over there. Um, but the belief that became really strong or the motivation that became really strong was that I wanted to learn more about health. And that motivation that was uncovered over in the time of India, like sweeping leaves away from a you know picture underneath or a, a metal plaque underneath, great analogy, Lucas, it still continues 10 years later. And so if my spiritual experiences are, are anything like the psilocybin experience, then they can both take away your motivations as well as maybe give you new ones. So bottom line, uh, psilocybin is a shortcut, but maybe you need that shortcut. Maybe you need some openness and wisdom to clear out old beliefs that are holding you back. Uh, maybe you have PTSD and trauma that is just so a part of you at this point that you you can't even feel it anymore. You don't even know it's there. You just know your life is a constant struggle and burden. And maybe you've never met God. Well, psilocybin will definitely shake things up. Either way, it's a very personal decision. Uh, I'm at a place in my life where it doesn't sound right for me at the moment. I mean, maybe when I'm older or something, but uh, if I had depression or PTSD or crippling anxiety, I would be slamming mushrooms way before trying anything from the pharmaceutical uh, mental health debacle. I think I think most people could agree to that. So, oh, another thing uh, is I wouldn't take mushrooms continuously if I did do them either. Uh, I would go to a facility like the one that Jonas works at would, down in there down there in Jamaica. Uh, I'd have the experience and then I'd move on. I, you know, I'd come back down to earth and try and integrate the experience into a well-rounded life. So if you want to check out Jonas's company or YouTube, those links will be in the show notes. Uh, I liked his YouTube channel. It had some shorter videos on the Sphinx and UFOs. <laughs> it was it was pretty entertaining and interesting. I think, uh, I think you might like it too. So go check that out. Some of you have asked how you can give back uh, if you get value out of this podcast. I appreciate that. That's very kind. If you do get value out of this, all I ask is you to share it with others. Um, that is the hardest part of podcasting is getting out there and getting seen. So take the chance, click that share button. People won't judge you. It would be a huge help. Well, people will judge you. Yeah, they'll, they'll judge you, but they don't matter. So otherwise, thank you for listening. Be well. Be well.